Hello everybody, welcome back. It's lecture number 15. We are going to wrap up all these linear decision boundary classifiers that we've been talking about. The support vector machine, logistic regression, the perceptron. And we're gonna kind of compare all of them together as well as introduce one new classifier which is not linear in any way, shape, or form. That's the K nearest neighbors. So, uh, Let's just go ahead and get straight into the heart of the matter. So there we go. Um, so let's just return to support vector machines so I can both recap and give you a particular spin on what you've already heard from the Andrew Ng lectures. So SVMs are large margin classifiers. What they're set up to do is to draw that decision boundary in a way which gives it the biggest margin between the boundary and the nearest data points that are close to it, okay? So the terminology, oops, the terminology is that these nearest data points to the boundary, they're called support vectors. Why are they support vectors? Well, from wherever the origin of this thing is, uh, right? The point is defined as a vector, okay? So the support vectors are those points which are right here, the closest to the decision boundary. They are the, um, and the distance between the decision boundary and that point, that's so small, it's so hard to draw. I'm sorry about that. So the distance in there is called a margin, all right? And the size of that margin is determined by the weights, the parameters of the support vector machine, okay? Um, so uh, the, the Andrew Ng lectures definitely gave you a sense of how that works, right? That the projection of this vector onto the weight vector is the thing that determines the size of the margin, okay? So it's that projection of x onto the weight, vec onto the weight vector is uh, multiplied by the magnitude of the weight vector itself, okay? So the projection can't change, right? So changing the, the margin location has to involve this term, just to kind of recap what Ng was talking about, okay? So it's the usual setup. We have a training set, and we know that what we want to do is we want to minimize the size of those weights to maximize the size of the margin. And we're going to do that subject to a particular loss function, which we have already talked about, like I said, with Ng. It's the hinge loss. Okay, what is going on here? Well, not only do we want to find the maximum size of the of a margin, we want to uh, say that anything which is outside of our margin is good. We don't care about it. There's no loss. Okay. So if you have any data points out here, great, zero loss. Okay. Now remember that theoretically, the decision boundary is right here, right? So what we are going to do is we're going to say that anything that's getting too close to the decision boundary, anything that's encroaching onto it, that goes inside of this support vector, inside of this margin, we don't like it. We want to penalize it. Okay? So that is the intuition behind the hinge loss. Anything over here, right? No loss. Anything 
in here, oops, we're going to generate a loss. Okay? And once we get to zero, once we cross the decision boundary, then our loss keeps getting bigger and bigger. So something over here would generate even more loss because it's on the wrong side of the decision boundary. So now we're, now we're over there. All right. So uh, that hinge loss is the written at, like, out like this, right? So it's the maximum of either 1 minus v. So when v is 0, then that value is 1. If v is negative, then this value becomes greater than 1, right? And uh, this notation here just says the same as this one, right? It's the maximum of 0 or 1 minus v. So 1 minus v, of course, if you kept projecting it, would go that way. But nope, sorry, we don't get to do that. We're going to take the maximum of 0 or 1 minus v. So well, at this point, we hit 0 as the maximum. So we go across like that. All right. So that's the hinge loss. And that hinge loss is what induces this term. Okay, the 1 minus y times the uh, x, w transpose x plus b with the criteria right there, which is this criteria, right, which is actually the same thing as this. So this term in here is either 0 when the dots are over in this part of the regime, that is when they're on the right side of the margin, or it's this value, right? Okay. And again, this term over here is we're going to try to squish the weights down. And by squishing the weights down, we're going to bring the margin out. And this term he here is we're going to care about misclassification, and we're also going to care about dots that are inside the margin, not yet on the wrong side of the decision boundary. OK, so this is a misclassification term. And it also has a component where if you're within the margin, I should just write it this way. Oh, it's behind my head, Dumas. OK, so misclassification plus uh, inside the margin. OK, bad to be inside the margin. And this is make the margin big. And also, of course, regularize the setup, which is always good. Whenever we squish the weights down, we're regularizing, right? We're, pre we're penalizing very complicated uh, solutions over potential overfitting. All right. So how does that all play out uh, when we go ahead and, oh, sorry. So. There's, there's one more elaboration that we didn't hear at all uh, during the lectures from Andrew Ng. So what if your data points are not separable, like we've talked about? What if you have some messiness? So in the case where we have red dots on the wrong side of the margin and blue dots on the wrong side of the margin, sorry, not the margin, the wrong side of the decision boundary. Right? So when we're on the wrong side of the decision boundary, we have misclassifications. We know that we cannot possibly linearly separate these perfectly. 
okay? But we can allow some slack, is what they call it, a little bit of slack in the system, all right? So we're gonna allow a certain number of these points on the wrong side of everything. How do we do that? How do we allow points on the wrong side? Well, we have to introduce a slack variable. And slack in this case is going to be notated by the Greek letter psi, okay? Which, um, something like that, right? Psi for slack. Um, so this is supposed to be psi, but sorry, that was a copy paste kind of setup. So what we're gonna do now is instead of minimizing misclassification error, we're gonna try to minimize slack, where slack is defined as this distance right here between the margin where we were, right, we're happy with any dots on this side. So anything on the wrong side of the margin is bad, but even worse is something that's not just on the wrong side, but completely on the wrong side of the decision boundary as well. So this in here is psi. This is the distance psi. So we're gonna to try to minimize those size, right? We're gonna to try to pick a margin that minimizes those. Right, so we're gonna put that in here. There's the size. And we're gonna minimize that whole thing subject to, again, this misclassification setup, y sub i times wtx plus b is greater than or equal to one minus psi. That's the thing we're gonna add in, right? So when we minimize subject to one minus psi, what we're allowing is we're allowing a little bit of slack, okay? We're letting, we're essentially, effectively, um, going to allow these dots to move back those size, okay? We're gonna let the dots crawl back onto the margin from which they should be, right? So instead of saying greater than one being the margin, right, we're gonna say greater than one minus psi. So we're gonna allow things to be that far out. Okay, so how do we solve this? Well, just look at the definition of what we wrote down as the subject to, right? The implication there is that, so if this stuff over here has got to be greater than or equal to one minus psi, well, we can just go ahead and bring everything around to the other side. So psi is now the maximum of one minus y sub i times wt x sub i b, or zero, right? We've, we've brought it right into the hinge loss, okay? And we've defined this, the slack variable as the term from the hinge loss. Well, that makes our life easy because then we can replace psi with that stuff. And at that point, we're actually in really good shape because this just reduces down to the form we're familiar with from the hinge loss. So it's actually an identical formulation. Nothing really changes in the loss function at all. We just are allowing the slack variables, okay? Just to show you that the whole point is that this mathematical formulation enables us to address overlapping data points and it enables us to address it without actually changing the loss function, which is quite magical. Okay, the only thing that we need to know is that this is the term which is uh, dealing with the slack variable. And so if we want to allow some slack, then we have to have C not be too big, okay? If C, our regularization parameter, gets dialed up very, very large, then this becomes a very big term. And we try to squish out the slack. That's not what we want when we want to allow slack. 
So when we want to allow for non-overlapping, sorry, for overlapping distributions and still allow a large margin, we have to keep our C variable relatively small. When we want a hard margin, where we don't want to allow any slack, when we want to fit inside this, this whole setup, the one uh, bound, decision boundary that we can actually fit regardless of how uh, little margin we get out of the system, then we make C very, very high. Okay. So just to finish the whole SVM thing, we have a loss function, right? That loss function is determined by that hinge loss, right? Here is that hinge loss. And minimizing the weight parameters so that we can maximize the margin size. Well, it's the same old, same old. When we want to actually solve this thing and do some gradient descent with it, what do we have to do? We have to derive this as a partial with respect to the weights. And that's pretty easy, right? So the partial with respect to the weights of the weight squared is just the weight. That one half allows everything to disappear. So this term in here, well, when, uh, when it's zero and it's zero, uh, when there is a, a loss term, then we have this bit, y sub i, x sub i, is the only bit that comes through. Everything else is a constant, so it goes away. The bias is even easier. Just like always, we just get the, uh, the output as the bias term, et voila. Okay, oh, thought I undid that animation. Oh well. All right. So I mentioned gradient descent to you, which probably already tells you the answer to this question, but let's see if you can give me the mathematical answer, right? So this is our loss function. Is it convex, concave? Oh, that should be not convex, not no convex. Um, or what? Give yourself a moment to think. Yeah, you with the uh, blue hat in the second row. Yes, it is indeed a convex function, right? And as I was hinting, we wouldn't be doing gradient descent very well if it was not convex. We would probably get stuck in local minima. Okay, but how is it convex? Well, it's convex because it's the summation of two convex functions, right? The L2 norm, it's a quadratic function, right? This one, it's the hinge loss, right? Hinge loss is convex, you can see it. So uh, that is why we know that the summation of two convex functions has to be convex and therefore this is convex. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, what are sport vector machines, right? They're these large margin classifiers and by regularizing the weights, by squishing the weights down, not only do we penalize overfit, we also increase the margin. We put that decision boundary in places where it gets the maximum space that it can do to the support vectors, to the nearest dots, to the nearest data. Okay. Um, so what else is important? Uh, there's parameters and support vectors, notably that C term. And that's typically found using cross-validation to select the parameter. So we would divide up your data set into a testing set, right, that you hold out until the end, and then data that you use for validation. And then you would use the cross-validation method to, uh, for each one of these possible values of C you want to explore, you would run a cross-validation with all of your validation data and find the average performance level for that setting of the parameter C, 
and you would compare that you do the same cross validation on the same data multiple times for parameters where c is equal to 1, c is equal to 5, c is equal to 10, etc., etc. And then pick the c which produces the best average performance across the folds of the cross validation. This is something which I'm previewing now. We're going to talk about it in depth, uh, I think, next week. So, um, once you have the optimal C for your cross validations from your validation set, then you can find out its generalization by testing it out on the test set. All right, so uh, what else is important here? Um, we have the kernel trick. The kernel trick I haven't really talked about at all. Uh, so Andrew did, and it fundamentally what we do is we're adding new uh, variables to the system, right? And I want you to really think about it like I was saying, as if uh, when we were doing polynomial features for the linear regression, right? We had x, and if we just used x as the input to the regression, then we would have gotten a line. So we leave x in there, we don't take it away, and we added in x squared as a new variable, right? That was the polynomial features thing, and that enables us to fit a curve. And we add x squared and x cubed and however many orders of polynomial we wanted, we added those new variables to the system. And the kernel trick is exactly like that. We leave the variables that were there, and we add the Gaussians that we want to add, all right? And in doing that, it makes things separable, and it also enables you to have this nonlinear basis for making the decision. Now, um, what else is kind of important here? Uh, some of the things we didn't talk about, and I don't really have time to, but just to let you know, is that when you do go to kernels, when you're in that kernel space, there is a fancy way to calculate the, uh, the answer to the support vector machine's loss function using Lagrangian, func uh, Lagrangian decomposition of the situation. Okay, like I said, it's kind of beyond the level here, but just there's like special tricks to do efficient computation with kernels. All right, so um, this recap slide has animations that I forgot to remove, and I hate that. So we have all the pieces in place, right? We have a loss function. It involves both the margin and also the uh, the, the misclassification hinge loss. And it's a pretty easy to solve kind of situation. We can go ahead and do gradient descent on it. Okay. Now, the burning question, isn't SVM kind of similar to logistic regression? And in fact, if you remember during those lectures, uh, Andrew Ng shows you that yes, there's a way to kind of show that SVM comes from a very similar loss function as logistic regression, right? So how are these different from each other? I will let you have a moment. All right, somebody give us an answer. Yes, yellow dress. They do, they differ in training, but not in their testing. They're in the same in testing, exactly right. Okay, because the training of the two of them, oh man, I need to kill these animations I inherited. They're terrible. Ah, now I have to start over. All right. So the training in the one case is based on the logistic function, right? And the log loss that we showed you, what, my gosh, like more than a week and a half ago now, 
right? Is there a loss function? Okay, there is a similar formulation here, but it is different where we have the regularization of the two terms on this side. So the training is different, but the testing is just the hard classifier, right? It's a plus one if we meet criteria, and the criteria includes Wx plus b, just a logistic form of it. And in this case, it's if we meet the threshold, right? If we cross Wx plus b, then it's a positive case, just the same. They are identical except for exactly what this term is, but still fundamentally, it's a threshold defined by the parameter vector w. Pretty cool stuff, yeah? All right. How do we see the relationships, right, between all these linear classifiers? Because they are obviously highly related. So we started off with the linear decision boundary, which has got a standard 0, 1 loss. You're either correct or you're wrong. And if you're wrong, you get a 1, you get an, a penalization, bad, bad, bad boy, fix this, change the decision boundary. All right, that's the 0, 1 loss. And if you're not wrong, it's a 0. Everything's happy. Okay, so that turns into the familiar form here, right? Where for every element, it's a one if the sign doesn't match the truth. Okay, so it's directly minimizing what we care about, which is misclassification, great? But it's terrible, it's terrible to minimize because the whole thing is a big bucket of no gradient. You can't minimize it, okay? You can only do this when there's a closed form solution. There is no way to do gradient descent on this because there is no gradient, right? Things which are flat, no gradient. Except for right here, where the gradient is infinite, so that's good. All right. So, we showed you a way out of this situation. When we uh, were talking about the perceptron, we introduced the half hard loss. So it's zero when everything's correct, and it just goes up linearly when something is incorrect. Okay? So this is, as I mentioned, fundamentally enables us to do a gradient descent on a linear decision boundary which is also known as a perceptron. Now, um, so the loss, is, the loss is based on the distance, right, to the boundary. So if things are far away on the wrong side, like in this case, then we are going to have a larger loss, right? So a far away loss is going to put us over here, high, high up and a nearby loss like this one is gonna put us lower down on the error. Okay, um, it has a gradient here. It has no gradient here. But hey, we've got at least half of the problem solved now. All right, then we introduced you to the logistic function and minimizing the log loss function. So again, the logistic function is that whole, just to minimize confusion on terminology. That's the logistic function. But the log loss function is the way in which we can guarantee convexity using this thing, all right? So the log loss, we throw natural logs on the thing and get rid of a bunch of stuff and we end up in that, all right? And we were showing you that this is the shape of the logistic, sorry, of the log loss function and it is indeed convex, which makes it nice, right? So we put in, we can put in our linear decision boundary and the nice thing is that we have a gradient at every single place we could imagine along this function. 
okay? And again, the further away you are from the decision boundary, the larger the loss. And we've got this softened shape to it, okay? Which is lovely. We have, we have the ability to do gradients now. All right. Finally, we have support vector machines. And support vector machines, they have their own kind of half-hard error. Very particularly, it's called the hinge loss. Now, it looks suspiciously like the perceptron's loss. It's half-hard loss, but there's an important thing. Instead of, in the perceptron's case, it looked like that. It did the hinging at zero. Here we do the hinging at one. And by hinging at one, we're saying, hey, back off. Even if you're on the right side of the decision boundary, Mr. Data Point, I want you further away. I want to set the decision boundary so that there's more space in between the decision boundary and the nearest data points. Okay, we've been talking about that. There's our loss function, which has the two terms, one of which is a regularization, which is increasing the margin, and the other of which is the misclassification error using the hinge loss. Okay, so it has gradient for everything that is less than one, and zero elsewhere, so we can use a gradient descent. It is convex, so we can use a gradient descent. And everything is very happy, right? Here they are all together. Okay, so what's kind of neat to note is that here is the 0, 1 loss, which is our granddaddy. And here is the hinge loss. One of the things about the hinge loss is that it's a tight upper bound. Okay, the hinge loss is always above the 0, 1 loss at every single point. It's either the same as the 0, 1 loss, or it's worse at every single point. And it's a tight upper bound clipping the corner of the 0, 1 loss right there. So 0, 1 loss, bad deal, can't gradient descent it. Let's do something that is pretty similar, does the same kind of thing, and it gets us an upper bound on it. So we know that the hinge loss is always worse. So we're always going to be driving towards perfection harder. Sounds pretty cool. Okay, so let me get rid of the zero one loss there. And now uh, you can see a little bit better the, the other losses that we've been talking about. Okay, so the um, The binomial deviance here, sorry, I stole this uh, figure from somebody else, is the logistic function, right? So it's got this nice smooth shape there on the green line. You have the hinge and uh, various other kinds of things there that we shouldn't worry about. Actually, I should have grabbed a different version clearly because I don't want to confuse the matter. But you can see that there are various levels of softness here, right? With the logistic being the softest and the half hard, uh, uh, well, which the half hard isn't even on here. So I really did pick the wrong figure. Sorry, all. Well, at any rate, you get the idea. Stacking them up on top of each other, let me add my own half hard, right? It's kind of the most divergent of the lot. It has a little bit less to do with things, but it's still functional in terms of a loss function driving learning. All right, since I messed that up, let's get off this slide fast. Now, all of those things have been linear decision boundary kinds of algorithms. What about if we want to do nonlinear? Well, the one thing we've seen so far is using a radial basis function for the support vector machine. That gets us to some nonlinear abilities. But let's look at another very common, very simple algorithm. It's called nearest neighbors. It comes down to a very, very easy thing. 
when you have a new data point, look around in all of your training set and find the element of the training set which is closest to your data point. The nearest neighbor algorithm says whatever the class is of the near, nearest thing in the training set, that's my class too. Okay? And it extrapolates from there. So not just the nearest neighbor, but we can use a bunch of nearest neighbors. Why would we do that? Well, obviously there's a potential for some being wrong if you just use the nearest neighbor. Okay? Imagine some cases like this, where we have and here is our O's and we have a new test point, all right? And if that new test point is, say, here, it's not immediately clear what we should do, right? Well, maybe the nearest neighbor is, well, I probably drew that pretty poorly for doing an example, right? So in this case, it seems obvious that maybe we should take the nearest neighbor. It should be this guy, all right? Well, what if we draw it kind of here All right. In that case, maybe if this is a decision boundary that looks like this, we could get the wrong answer, right? We would end up saying this is our nearest neighbor, this uh, yellow O, and well, that's it, right? But if the decision boundary is something that looks like this, then if we took a vote of all of our nearbys and we found out what the thing with the most votes was and used that, that could get us out of some of this kind of trouble. Okay? Uh, especially important here is also when we're trying to smooth out raggedy jaggedy decision boundaries, which can occur with this, as we will see in a second. All right. So the k nearest neighbors is a, a, a generalization of the nearest neighbor, right? We're going to find the k nearest neighbors. So if k is 1, it's just the nearest neighbor algorithm. If k is 3 or 5, then we find the 3 or 5 nearest neighbors and we take the majority vote across all of them. Now. Why do why did we say that common values are 3 and 5 or 7 or 9? Anybody? How about somebody up in the back row there? Come on, I know some of you are paying attention. Why would we use an odd number for a voting scheme? Yes, you got it. Exactly you have to have a tiebreaker, right? You don't want to use even numbers because what do you do if they're split? Okay? All right. So the cool thing about this is it's non-parametric. It's not based upon a statistical distribution that's supposed to be there. It's not based upon this idea that there's, you know, class A and class B and that maybe they're clumpy or something like that. No. Nearest neighbor allows you to have your data be in any shape. It doesn't care about, it doesn't have a prior which is going to force it to have a certain kind of form in its answer. And as you may be able to tell from the kinds of things I'm saying, K nearest neighbors can overfit like hell. Okay? It has basically no bias. It has no idea of what the data should be put into bins, how it should be binned up. No, just take the data and use the data as its own model. And if the data is super, super wiggly, then the decision boundary that comes out of K-nearest neighbors is going to be super, super wiggly. All right, and the flip side, 
we've generally been talking about parametric kinds of approaches that have essentially a form to the solution they're looking for. And they're just setting the parameters to make those work. So what does it look like if you have two blobs that have some overlap? Right here is two blobs with some overlap in the yellows and the blues and the decision boundary you can see drawn there. As you can see, the decision boundary is very wiggly for the nearest neighbor, the one nearest neighbor classifier. At all points in there, what we're seeing is, you know, what is the nearest thing? On this side, it's that yellow. On that side, it's that blue. And that's determining, right, which class that is. And you can see that when you have little islands here, it's because there's a yellow surrounded by blue. That certainly looks to me like some kind of overfitting, right? There's just random noise corrupting the underlying process. That's the kind of thing you get. All right, well, to be less overfit, instead of just using one nearest neighbor, we can use more neighbors. And having more neighbors necessarily smooths things out as we take an average across all of the votes. So at seven nearest neighbors, we get a smoother decision boundary. We don't have these island issues anymore. Okay, and it just runs right across areas of the highest density for the positive class. And we still have this kind of uh, peninsula here, right? So it's still a very complex decision boundary, not at all linear. Okay, what if we go crazy? What if we use 15 neighbors? Well, it gets smoother still, and we lose that peninsula. Okay, which one's right? I don't know. You're the one who has the data. You're the one who has to make a judgment call or do some kind of cross-validation to fit your model. So to make this a big general thing, this is what on this data set it looks like on training data error, right? Is it surprising that, sorry, I should mention, here is the number of neighbors. So one nearest neighbor, three nearest neighbors, five nearest neighbors, seven, 11, 21, etc. This is on a log scale on that axis. Okay. So as the number of nearest neighbors goes up, the training error is going down. but the test error is going up. Actually, that's not what that's showing, is it? I'm totally confused by that graph because it should show the training error going down with the number of neighbors. No, my bad. That's absolutely correct. Man, I'm tired. All right. So nearest neighbor, one nearest neighbor can overfit like hell and it can make the training error zero, right? And that's that blue line. Man, I'm sorry. I got so confused by, for myself for a moment. So you guys shouldn't feel bad if you're confused either, All right? So the training error is lowest when we can allow the greatest overfitting to the data, All right? And as the number of neighbors goes up, we smooth and squish and smooth away all the craziness, and we're going to get more and more training set error. Test set error does the U-shaped curve, right? At first, we are way overfitting on the data. We don't get good generalization. As we increase the number of neighbors, at some point we reach an optima, where this is the best we can do in the data. And then we start getting worse again. Why? Because now we're underfitting. We're smoothing away the realities. Okay, so this is another way in which you would find the best parameter. You would find the right K that does the best job. So what do we need to know about nearest neighbor? It seems like it's super simple, but there's just a little bit more you need to know. All right, so, um, Typically, nearest neighbor is good when 
you're trying to do things in real variables. It gets weirder when you do something categorical. Okay, so if it's real numbers measurements, then great. Um, you can do it in categories, but it, you have to change the way things operate. All right, so um, generally it doesn't do well when you have a lot of variables. Don't do, I, I'm going to show you why in a second, but don't do 10,000 variable problems with nearest neighbors. All right, it has super fast training because guess what? What is training? It's writing the data set into memory. That's all. Writing the training set into memory, that is training. Okay? That means that the big O notation on training is order one, or the memory, sadly, is order N, however many data points you have in the training set. Um, now, the disadvantage is that all that speed on training is lost at test time because the brute force method of doing k nearest neighbors is to look through every single data point in your training set and see is this the closest nope try again is this one the closest yeah it's not good it's big o n right the size of the training data set and likewise the memory is big o n duh so, uh, obviously some effort has been put at fixing those limits. Um, it's also interesting to note that this is the inverse of almost every other machine learning algorithm out there. Most machine learning algorithms take the time at training. That's when you have to spend the computational time. Um, and testing is much more free. That would be true, for instance, especially of deep learning networks. So to do nearest in the nearest neighbor, we have to have a conception of what is near and what is far. We have to have some measure of distance. Commonly, we end up using the Euclidean metric, the L2 norm. Um, so that is why we say reals, right? That if we say the instance map to points in real is the, what the slide here says. So we uh, we want to do reals. Euclidean makes total sense. The Euclidean distance tells you that you know these points are. This is the straight line between them in the in the end space. Okay. But I want to kind of introduce something that I probably should have covered previously, which is the idea of a metric space or a metric function, right? It gets used over and over again in machine learning. When we did error metrics and we were talking about mean squared error, right? That's a metric space. What is a metric space? How does this work? Well, essentially for something to be a metric, it has to have three qualities, right? When the distance that's being measured is um, equal to zero is happens when x and y are the same point right however we're defining these uh, the 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 vector space at which it's operating on when x and y are the same kind of vector then the distance has to be zero right the distance between x and y is the same as between y and x we have a symmetric thing and we have to have what's called the triangle inequality. You will know it from such hits as the Pythagorean theorem, right? So x, y, z. So this distance has to be less than or equal to those two distances added together, all right? And that's the triangle inequality. And like I said, uh, Pythagoras's version of that is what we meet in the Euclidean space, all right? So any kind of function 
that has these qualities can be used as a metric. And there are a bunch of common metrics in machine learning, and there's some crazy weird rare ones as you get to particular algorithms, right? We've already seen and talked about the L1 and L2 norms. Um, the, it's often called Euclidean for L2 norm. You will hear Manhattan or city block distance or taxi cab distance for L1 norm, right? And all that is is just add up all the vector bits together. Do the subtraction of vector one minus vector two and add up all the elements of that subtraction. That's the L1 norm. Now, the Lebesgue norms, the, the L whatever, there's an arbitrary metric that you will see out there called Minkowski, which takes the argument P, which is the order of the Lebesgue norm. Another thing that you'll see for uh, stuff involving uh, probabilities, and, uh, and essentially it's a generalization of the z-score, is the Mahalanobis distance. Mahalanobis just is like, just like when you look at how many standard deviations am I away from the mean, which is what a z-score tells you. Mahalanobis does that for any kind of um, weird, non-spherical kind of distribution. All right. Um, and last is the Hamming distance. And the Hamming is used for binary features, right? It's just like our, when we have a string of ones and zeros, and we have a different string of ones and zeros, how many of them are the same? Okay, that's the Hamming distance. Actually, I should say, how many of them are different? That's the Hamming distance, All right? Wherever the ones and zeros don't line up. Okay, for k-nearest neighbors, you can use any kind of distance metric you want, right? Depends on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Maybe you're trying to solve a problem which is naturally in a hyperbolic space. And so you use some weird ass hyperbolic metric like a, a lady I used to sit next to love to do. Um, so Tanya Sharpie and the Salk is like super into hyperbolic machine learning things. And I'm like, okay, it turns out there's a lot of those. I never knew that, whatever. The point is, is that you can fit any kind of norm and metric that you want. Um, and K nearest neighbors just looks in whatever that metric space is to find the neighbors, neighbors being defined by the metric you choose. And if you have a particular problem, maybe you can construct a metric that helps you solve it. Okay, so Hamming, by the way, would typically be used for a categorical kind of event, right? So in, you'd use Euclidean for the real valued like we talked about. And if you do have something categorical, Hamming would be the typical choice there. All right, just a few more bits and bobs. Uh, when we have a bunch of different variables with k-nearest neighbors, you have to be careful because uh, if one of them is much bigger than the others numerically, right, it can come to dominate the distance measures, right? So if one thing is measured from zero to one, and a different variable is measured from 0 to 10 million, then the 0 to 10 million is going to dominate every distance measure in Euclidean space. So this is one of those cases where a feature is going to be constructed, right? We're not going to use the raw data where we have variable A, which is 0 to 1, and variable B, which is 0 to 10 million. We're going to take each one of them and we're going to z-score the situation, okay, or something similar. And we're going to get the standard deviation and we're going to say, how many standard deviations away from the mean am I, all right? So we transform the raw vectors into some, some sort of z-scored or similarly normalized version of themselves. And that way, the scale of the vectors is the same in every variable. And that way, no single variable comes to dominate the conversation when they all have the same maximum and minimum, roughly speaking. Okay, and if you know that one variable is more important than another, you can go ahead and uh, 
my iPad is acting up. You can go ahead and weight the important variables over the non-important variables. All right. Finally, just a little word about dimensionality in k-nearest neighbors. So k-nearest neighbors is, does not do well with large numbers of variables. Don't do it, all right? So this is what's called the curse of dimensionality. Suppose we have a bunch of data points to distribute through a unit cube, okay? Or a unit hypercube, right? And we wanna find neighbors, okay? That's the whole point of this algorithm. Where are my neighbors? Well, if your neighbors are dense, there are a lot around you, you're going to get a pretty good picture of what's going on. But if your neighbors, if your neighborhood is like northern Montana and the next neighbor is, you know, essentially the same distance as driving from here to El Centro, then you're not going to get a good picture of what you're category is based upon these neighbors, quote unquote, that are so far away. Well, the density of a space that you're trying to throw this data into, let's just imagine that this data we're throwing into this space is randomly distributed throughout the whole space. So we just salt and pepper the situation. Well, in one dimension, if you look at um, half of the one-dimensional space, you find that roughly half of the randomly salt and pepper data is in that location, all right? But if we go to two dimensions, then we get down to like a quarter-ish, right? And it gets worse. When we go to three dimensions, we're down again. And it turns out that the relationship is actually to the power of 1 over d, or to the power of negative d. So this is the relationship of the density. All right. So the more dimensions d you get, the lower your density, and it goes in a polynomial fashion. So it grows way, way, way more than linear. Right. So once, but once we get to four dimensions, this, you know, half of each dimension kind of thing has a tiny, tiny number. Just 3% of the data captured in the 4D case. All right. So this is how you need exponentially large amounts of data when you have large numbers of variables for k-nearest neighbor. Because again, you need to have neighbors to have K nearest neighbors work. Here's an example where we can see it in one and two dimensions. All right. Here we have oh, in my highlighter. So this is our new data point, and we want to query the neighbors around us. What class am I? And that seems to work pretty well, right? We've got a number of neighbors. They're all the same. Well, what if we have two dimensions? Now, each one of these is still true, all right? So we still have the same neighbors that we did in one dimension, but it's just that they're all spread out. And so now my answer looks very different and my neighborhood is very sparse. And if it gets really much worse than this, I'm not sure if I've got a good possibility of getting a decent categorization at all. All right, so k nearest neighbors, not for large numbers of dimensions. Um, okay, so just lastly, a word about solving this, okay? So the brute force approach where you have to just check your distance to every single data point in the training set can obviously break down when the training set is very, very big. Nobody wants to go do that. Okay. If your training set is the size of the internet, that is not sustainable. Okay. And there are plenty of times where people have figured out how to do K nearest neighbors in internet sized data sets. And it works fundamentally by two 
Currently, there are two uh, algorithms. There used to just be KD trees, but nowadays there's locally sensitive hashing is also quite popular, All right? So the intuition behind KD trees, um, can I have, there we go, is pretty simple, all right? So what we do is we have two dimensions of data here, just like before, and we have all of our little dots that are in our training set. And what we do is we take um, we take one of the dimensions, the one that is maybe the most informative for us, and we find the median and we draw a dividing line. And then we take the remaining dimension and we go and find the median value on that dimension, which is this one, and we draw the dividing line. And we do that again and again for everything left until we've divided up all the data points going from here here, the median, uh, sorry, the median, yeah, so it's between that and that, and then this one, and then that one, okay? All right, so now we have created a binary tree, right? Where the root, let me get rid of my bad drawing, where the root is this green, and it's that location right there because that was where we started on the median of x1, okay? And its children are there in the pinkish kind of color, right? So this is tree search. For those of you that have had some algorithms experience, it's pretty nice. All we do is we go, okay, all right, I'm gonna tree search. I'm gonna start at the root of my tree. I'm gonna check you and I'm gonna check you and uh, whichever one of you is closer to my new data point in here in blue, I'm gonna go with you, all right? Well, it turns out that the left side of this graph is much closer than the right side. So I'm going to say, no thank you, right side of the graph. You're not, my solution is not over there, all right? Then we now are operating at this place. That's where we're starting from. That was my, the child of the, of the, the root of the tree that we're going to operate from. So we do it again. We check the two children in there in yellow. We find out which one is closer to the new data point we're interested in, and we block off the remaining, and now we have our answer. Okay? So that's a super simple version of KD trees. Um, they're just a binary search algorithm. But you can use that kind of thing to very quickly deal with large numbers of data points, much quicker than uh, the brute's for, brute search, which is order n, right? This is order n log n, if I'm remembering correctly. So that's good. Pretty significant speed up. Um, locally sensitive hashing is like a whole different ball of wax. And this is really where you can start to get towards internet sized data sets. Um, so if you're familiar with a hash function, what that means is that we take some input and we generate a transformation of that input. Well, local, the usual reason that you wanna do that is to create some unique representation, okay? Um, but in this case, we want the so-called collisions. We want a hash table to go ahead and generate collisions, and we want it to generate collisions for nearby neighbors, for neighbors that are close to each other in this metric space that we're operating in. We want them to be assigned to the same bucket of the hash function, okay? So these are just implementations of k-nearest neighbors just to give you the flavor that even something as simple as nearest neighbors as an algorithm, when you want to actually use it, requires a bit of computational know-how, okay? So lastly, I wanted to close out just with some classic data sets, all right? This one here is two overlapping blobs like we've seen a lot of the times. This one here is a concentric problem. 
And this one over here is interlocking moons. Okay, those are the underlying truths in this data, which is then peppered with random noise. So across the top, we have here uh, just a plain old linear decision boundary, a linear SVM, logistic regression, perceptron, a radial basis function SVM, and the nearest neighbors. Okay, and I believe, oh gosh, pretty sure that's five nearest neighbors. I've forgotten. All right, let me get my face out of the way here. So uh, what do you see there? Well, it's pretty clear that all of the linear algorithms here are very, very, very similar. And likewise, these two over here produce very similar results. The only real difference between any of these is just kind of the angle of the decision boundary a little bit. But, you know, the, uh, the linear decision boundary, the linear SVM, logistic perceptron, they all kind of mess up the half moons. I mean, they do okay-ish, but they're, they're getting just under 90% accuracy. Okay, in the concentric donuts, they truly mess it up. They're all 40% accurate. They can't find any way other than to draw a line through things, so. Right? And uh, they do better on the overlapping blobs, right? They all do kind of 95%. Now, the only thing to note is that on the overlapping blobs, um, only SVM has a very vertical, which is the correct decision boundary, right? because it was able to find the slack and find the margins that gave you the best answer. It was the, in this kind of a data set, it's the optimal for that problem. Well, okay. All the linears basically came out the same. These two on the right, they look basically the same too, and they're able to capture these nonlinear data sets. Okay, so they are able to properly fit the moons and the uh, the concentrics, but they horribly overfit when they come to these overlapping blobs, right? They're too complicated. All right. So this kind of a thing gets you the idea of what are all these algorithms, how are they interrelated, right? We know that there's mathematical interrelations, like the fact that the um, logistic regression and uh, the SVM are essentially kind of dual with each other, like just a small recasting of the loss function gets you from one to the other, okay? But algorithms go beyond their math, right? So they get into kind of the practicalities. So how do we choose using one of these or the other? Well, first off, if you want an interpretable model, if you're trying to do work in the statistical world where you've got to be able to say what's the probability of this thing being a given class, or if you want to understand what the model parameters are doing to make the decision, then something like logistic regression is a clear winner, okay? It's easily interpretable what the weights mean, and the result of that gives you a probability estimate of the class membership. So, okay. Now, if you don't care about interpretability, you just want to write answer, okay, then that doesn't necessarily mean you don't choose logistic regression, but maybe some of these other things will tell you, right? Obviously, a uh, well wiggly kind of problem needs a wiggly kind of algorithm, okay? K nearest neighbors, kernel SVM using radial basis functions. They perform very similarly. And in fact, just like Andrew Ng showed you that 
uh, there is a homology between logistic regression and uh, the linear sport vector machine, there is a homology between k-nearest neighbors and the kernel SVM using radial basis functions. Just think about the distance metric, right? The distance metric in k-nearest neighbors could be a Gaussian. And then you're basically most of the way there on your intuition about why they're homologous and why their answers therefore looked so similar on that last page. So we know that support vector machines, because they only care about the support vectors, about the things that are close to the decision boundary, they ignore all the stuff that's far, far away, right? They don't care about it. And therefore, they're less likely to overfit. Whereas something like logistic regression or a perceptron will take into account the outlier data points, and the outlier data points could pull the whole system into weird shapes, okay? So SVMs are if you're, you really need to generalize to new data, you might choose an SVM over these others. We know if you have a large number of variables, get rid of the k-nearest neighbors and take up an SVM because an SVM, besides it likes large numbers of dimensions because that helps you with the kernel trick, right? Where you can take something and separate it out into a high number of dimensions to make it linearly separable. Um, also, SVMs inherently have built into them regularization. So you can change the C value, lower it down to favor the weight penalization, and that's going to keep you from overfitting in these high dimensions, which is easy to do with high dimensions. Okay, you never care about perceptrons. Realistically, there's not a case where they're the best kind of thing. Except, of course, that when you start stacking a lot of perceptrons on top of each other, you suddenly arrive at deep learning, which is beyond the scope of this particular class. All right. Well, thank you very much for sticking with me as I went way over time. I hope that you learned something, and uh, I will look forward to chatting with you after Veterans Day. All right. Veterans Day is coming up. No lecture. Have fun. Bye.